Well, that's interesting, isn't it? I don't think we've ever done anything like that before. It should be fun. It's a creative way for us to support Angel's Attic and get out in our community and uh, do some fun stuff together. Uh, So hopefully you'll participate in that. But um, the idea behind that event comes from our our 5-2 Essentials, which if you've been a part of our volunteer training here, you know what that is. Uh, We take all of our volunteers through some training on uh, five basic practices that we think if everyone would invest in these, um, you put yourself in a good position to be used by God. This idea comes from John chapter 6 when Jesus is teaching a large crowd and it's been all day and no one's had anything to eat and uh, everyone is hungry. So the disciples said, Jesus, you got to send these people away so they can get some food. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, well, why don't, why don't you feed them? And their response is, we don't have enough. You know how much it would take, Jesus, to feed all of these people? We don't, we don't have enough. And Jesus says, well, bring me what you have. And they find a little boy who's got five loaves of bread and two fish. It's not enough. But Jesus takes it, and he blesses it, and he multiplies it, and he feeds thousands. And what we learn from that uh, on our end is that we don't, we don't have to have all the answers. We don't have to have all the resources. We can bring to God whatever we have. I think we often look at challenges in our church family or in our community or uh, in our world, and, and we think, man, somebody should do something about that. And maybe we look to God and we say, God, why aren't you doing something about that? And I wonder if sometimes he's not looking at us and saying, well, why don't, why don't you do something? And our response is, I don't have enough. I don't have enough talent. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough resources. But if we'll just take the spirit of this little boy and we'll bring whatever it is that we have, our five and two, God can take that and he can use it to bless many. So we believe that these five, two essentials, if we build these practices into our lives, will put us in a position to be used by God, to bring whatever the little is that we have and offer it to Jesus in a way that he can take it and bless it and uh, use it for many. So we're going to go over three of those essentials today and two of them next week. And the three that we go over today, we've sort of broken these down. These kind of apply to how we love our neighbor. And then there's uh, another end to the sentence. If you remember the command of Jesus to love your neighbor, what's the end of that sentence? We often forget that part because we're not really sure what to do with it. Uh, we're, we're taught that humility means you don't love yourself, which is, that's the incorrect teaching of humility, by the way, but it's kind of so what sinks in. So we, we don't, we forget about that part. So next week, the other two essentials will deal with how we love ourselves. So today, these will focus on loving our neighbor and next week, loving ourselves through these five essentials. So hopefully you'll take good notes today. Be ready for next week. Andy will be the one presenting those two to you next week. So we're going to start um, with the story of Nehemiah today. So if you have a Bible uh, and you can find Nehemiah, God bless you. It's, 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 in, it's tucked in there somewhere. We don't often go to it. So uh, good luck. Hopefully you've got those tabs at the front of your Bible. It'll help you out. Or if you're just using your device, it's super easy that way. Uh, Nehemiah lived at a time when the nation of Israel and, and Judah had been conquered Many people deported, and, and the, whole, the whole nation, the whole people group of the Jews was sort of a mess. Um, many had been killed. Many had been enslaved or, or taken in exile to other lands. And there's just a remnant. There's a remnant that God had promised he would preserve some of the people. So uh, in the 6th century BC, Nebuchadnezzar comes into Jerusalem, and Babylon destroys the city of Jerusalem, tears down the walls, burns the gates, Fast forward 100 years or so later, and you find Nehemiah. Uh, During that time, the Persians had conquered the Babylonians, and so now Persia is sort of the empire in control of this part of the world. They have a little bit different foreign policy than Babylon did, so they let a lot of the people go back to their homelands. And so there are Jews once again living in Judah and in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah lives in Susa, in the capital, in the Persian capital. And so that's where we're going to pick up. And uh, the book of Nehemiah, chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa, the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. 
And they said to me, the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. So this is the status report that Nehemiah gets. He asks of his friends, his brother, who's hundreds of miles away in Jerusalem, how are things going there? What's the situation? And the report he gets back is, it's not good. It's not good. And the reason why, the reason that's given for why things are not good is because the walls of the city have been torn down and the gates have been destroyed. Now, why, why is that such a problem? We don't live in walled cities today, so this may not make sense to us. We may someday live in a walled country. Who knows? I don't know. But we don't live in walled cities. Uh, so we don't really connect with why it's so important to have a wall around your city. But during this time, the wall was your only protection from your enemies. If you had anything that your enemy wanted and your enemy had enough force to take it, they could just waltz into your city at night, take whatever they want by force, and you can't stop them. But the wall keeps you safe. The wall protects you from your enemies. So without the wall, the people in Judah and in Jerusalem, every time they get a little bit ahead, they, 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 they make a little extra money from their crops this year, or they, something good happens, then their enemies will just come in and take whatever they have. They can't get ahead. And so they're... Their mission, which is to repopulate this area with Jews for the people of, of God to inhabit the promised land once again, it's just not going well. The people can't, they can't seem to get ahead. They're struggling. And this brings great shame upon them. That's an important word in the sentence. It's not just that they're hungry, that they're having a hard time getting ahead materially. Their pride, their national pride is hurt. This is their land. And yet they can't live there viably because... The walls of the city are broken down. So Nehemiah hears this news, and his response first is to pray. So he, he goes to God, and uh, I want to read the end of his prayer in verse 11. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. And give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. Now I was cupbearer to the king. So uh, Nehemiah is going to demonstrate for us throughout this story, I think, a principle that is important for us to embrace. And that is that followers of Jesus should assume the value of every person we encounter. Assume the value of every person we encounter. Do you do that? Do you assume the value of every person you encounter? Or do you, I think this is more common, do you sort of Wait until you see what kind of person this actually is. Well, let's find out if they actually have value. Let's see if they um, have anything that I respect about them. Are they, a, are they a person of integrity? Are they a person with leadership or authority or power? Are, are they a person whose financial decisions I would approve of? Are they a person whose political position I would approve of? Then I'll tell you if they're valuable or not. That's not really the way that Jesus lived and interacted with people. Jesus assumed the value of every person he encountered. And Nehemiah demonstrates this really well through three different um, practices that, that we're going to go over, the five two essentials. The first one is servant leadership. Servant leadership says, because you are valuable, and I start, my default mode is you are valuable. Because you're valuable, I will serve you joyful, joyfully. I'll serve joyfully. I assume that you're valuable. Therefore, if you have a need and I can meet it, I am willing to meet that need. That's his posture. He hears about this problem in Jerusalem. It's hundreds of miles away in a city he's never even been to, but these are his people. And he aligns himself with his people. Even though he doesn't know them, he's not making judgments on them. You know what would be really easy to do? It would be really easy to look at the people of Jerusalem hearing this news and go, well, why don't you just rebuild the wall? Why don't, why don't you guys take some responsibility, just rebuild the wall, and, and then you won't have this problem? Wouldn't that be easy? Isn't that what some of our advice would be? Maybe our, our position would be, you know what, I, I think you could just use some advice, so I'm going to write a letter back and say, all right, if the wall is broken and this is a problem, rebuild the wall. It's been a hundred years. Just rebuild the wall. And I'll sketch it out for you. Let me just show you how to rebuild a wall. You know, and let me, I'll draw you a diagram and send this to you and just rebuild the wall yourself. That's not Nehemiah's posture. His posture, and in his prayer, you hear in this prayer three times he calls himself a servant. 
He doesn't go to God and say, God, thank you for making me such a great leader. Thank you for giving me so much power and influence and intelligence that that you have called on me to solve this problem. That's not his posture at all. It's God, there's a problem. I'm your servant. If I can help, I'm willing. If I can help, I'm willing to help. That's, That's all he says. And servant leadership is, it's not about wielding authority over people. And I think that's sometimes where we get a little off when it comes to this concept, because most of us don't think of ourselves as leaders. Most of, most of us just kind of go, I'm, I, I don't have a lot of authority over people. I don't have a lot of power over people, so I'm not a leader. But in biblical terms, in the life and, and, and words of Jesus, that's not what leadership really is. Leadership begins with service. I serve you, and when I serve you, I earn a little influence. And then I serve you again, and I earn a little influence and trust. And I can use that influence to move you closer to God. And that is servant leadership. And so Nehemiah demonstrates this. He assumes the value of the people in Jerusalem. And he says, if I can help, I'll do so joyfully. Do you have opportunities to help? Are you aware of the needs around you? Sometimes the trick is just to be aware of the needs. I think most of us are willing to help. I I don't run into very many people who just sort of have this attitude of, you know, I'm going to take care of myself and everyone else is on their own. I don't know very many people like that. Most of you I know are willing to help. It's are we willing to find out what the need is? Nehemiah asks. He goes digging for information. And I think sometimes we, we need to be a little more aggressive in asking what the need is. I'll tell a story about my friend John here. John, um, many of you know me, he lost his wife a couple months ago and just been figuring out a new normal. And, and uh, there have been a lot of offers for help, you know, and I, I know sometimes it's, it's hard to know what to do there. So I just asked him one day, John, what's one thing? Just tell me one thing that if you could get some help with this, it would, it would be great. He said, I would just love to go to a few of my son's wrestling matches. I was like, all right. Let's see if we can figure that out, because he can't take all of his kids there. So um, I got on the phone, and within 15 minutes, I had three matches covered. People who were absolutely willing, just, yeah, just tell me what to do. Point me in the right direction, and I'll go. But we have to get beyond just saying, hey, call me if you need anything. Isn't that kind of what we say? And we absolutely mean it, don't you? When you say, call me if you, if you need anything, we mean it. And if they called, we would do whatever they asked. But they don't call, do they? We, ha- we have to be a little more strategic in our asking. Instead of just saying, call me if you need anything, just like, what is one thing? What is one challenge facing you that you- you're just not sure how you're going to figure it out? You're not sure how you're going to overcome this. You're not sure how you're going to make this work. Just tell me one thing. And, w- and when we ask like that, we're putting ourselves in a posture of a servant. And-, and we're not going to people saying, I think I can solve all your problems if you just, you know, listen to me for a minute. It's, I am here to help. Tell me one thing that you need. So, That's what servant leaders do. And when the call comes, people respond. And it's just amazing to see the level of humility that people are willing to take when they're just aware of the need. So part of what a servant leader does is helps people be aware of the need. Nehemiah took this responsibility on himself. And uh, let's be clear. Nehemiah, he gives his job description here at the end of that last verse we read. His job is he's a cupbearer to the king of Persia, okay? He is not an engineer. He is not a bridge builder, a project manager. He is not a wall builder. That is not what he does. I'm not sure he has the first clue how to rebuild a wall. But he doesn't let that stop him from putting himself in a position to help. So let me just share with you. Some of you think like, okay, there's a lot of things in the church that need to be done, but I don't have any of those skills, I'm not like a pastor. I'm not an evangelist. I'm not, I'm not really a prayer warrior. We just we need to let those people, those professionals do the work. Nehemiah was not a professional wall builder, but he's about to figure out how to build a wall because he's willing to put himself in a position of service. Okay, so uh, let's see what happens next. Uh, chapter two, verse one. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year, of King Artaxerxes when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now, I had not been sad in his presence because you're not, you, you're not supposed to be sad in the presence of the king. The king wants to be happy. He wants the people around him to be happy. So your job is to be happy in front of the king. But he's allowing his sadness to show. So the king said to me, why is your face sad? 
seeing that you are not sick, this is nothing but a sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid for Nehemiah to share with the king what's going on in, in a city that the king has no really, it's not a benefit to him to build up the city of Jerusalem. These people are subject to him. And to strengthen the people that he is oppressing just doesn't seem like it's in his best interest. So Nehemiah is terrified to tell him what's really going on. But it doesn't stop him. I was very much afraid, and I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. The cupbearer comes to the king and says, my city that's been destroyed, these people who are paying taxes to you, they're suffering, and I want to go with your permission and rebuild the city. Can I get like six months off to go and rebuild this city to make these people stronger that you are oppressing? <laughs> it's a ridiculous request, but do you notice what happens in the middle of this request? He stopped and prayed. Like the king says, what is it that you're asking? And he prays. And then he makes his request. And I wonder what that prayer was like. I wonder if it went something like this. God, this feels like a great opportunity, but this guy could just as easily chop off my head as he could say yes to my request. So give me boldness. Give me courage and success. Whatever he prayed for, God lined this up for him. So not only does the king give him the time off and say, absolutely, go and rebuild your hometown. He doesn't even ask some of the obvious questions like, Nehemiah, do you know how to rebuild a wall? He doesn't even ask that question. He just says, yeah, go knock yourself out. And Nehemiah, a little encouraged by this success in his boldness, asks the next question, he says, oh, um, and by the way, if you don't mind, would you pay for the project? Would you, would you give me letters to all the people that are in control of your timber supply and your stone supply? And just tell them to give me whatever I ask for so that I can take all the materials I need with me. <laughs> that's crazy boldness, isn't it? That's courage. That's beyond courage. That's a, that's a little crazy. And the king says, yes. He says, sure, absolutely. Take whatever you want. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? So he prays, God answers his prayer, and he steps forward with boldness. This is another um, of our five two essentials is courage. Courage says, you are valuable, therefore I will ask boldly. Because you're valuable to me, I will make bold requests on your behalf. How many of you believe in the power of prayer? Put your hand up. This is full participation. Do you believe in the power of prayer? How many of you believe that you, you could be a little more bold in your prayers? Isn't that interesting? We believe in the power of prayer, and yet a lot of times our prayers are sort of like, thank you for this food and um, keep me safe on my journey. And God's like, I got that. I can do that in my sleep. What else you got? I mean, is that... Is that really, do you, do you know what I can do? And that's, that's really all you're asking me for? Do you know the resources I have at my disposal and all you can think of is help me get a decent parking spot at Kroger? Like, come on, I can do so much more than that. Ask boldly on behalf of others. I think this is an important part of the asking boldly. When we ask boldly on behalf of others, there's this incredible story. In the book of Acts, when uh, Peter and John get in trouble for preaching the gospel and the religious leaders say, hey, you remember what we did to Jesus? We can do the same to you. Stop preaching about Jesus. And they go back to the rest of the disciples and they have a prayer time. And do you know what they ask for? They don't ask for God to keep them safe. They ask for boldness to preach the word. On behalf of others, God, 
It could cost us our lives, but there are people out there who need to know about Jesus. Would you give us boldness? Would you not allow our fear to stop us from sharing the good news about Jesus? And Nehemiah asked with boldness. And I think it's important that we are able to step in with some courage on behalf of others. Ask God with boldness, and we need to be able to ask other people with boldness. We need to demonstrate some courage in the way that we communicate to people. But a couple important points about courage in the way that we communicate. First of all, um, manipulation is not courage. Manipulation does not assume the value of the other person. It actually assumes that you can't deal with this person honestly. So you have to, you have to deceive in order to get your message across or get what you want. Um, most of us are, are uh, usually not aware when we're being manipulative. So if you want to demonstrate some courage today um, at lunch, ask your spouse, do I ever manipulate you? Just ask that question. See how that goes. It would take some courage, but you might get some really helpful feedback. Right? That's not courage. Passivity is not courage. Passivity assumes that the other person can't be trusted. Domineering is not courage. It assumes that the other person has no valuable input or insight or responsibility. So we need to make sure that when we're asking with boldness, we're doing it in a way that assumes the value of the other person. Because you're valuable to me, I, I can be assertive. I can ask boldly on your behalf. What would it cost you? What would it cost you? Are, are you sometimes aware that there are people around you who are having a bad day? Can you sometimes see it? D does everyone always have to tell you, hey, I'm having a bad day? Or can you sometimes tell? What, what, what about, so this happens to me often as I go grocery shopping and the, the cashier, by the time I get up there, three other people have already yelled at her because of something that didn't go their way. And, and you can just see on her face she's having a bad day, Right? What would it cost me to say, hey, are you okay? Can, can I pray for you? Do you mind if I pray for you? That, that feels a little out of the box. It's like, no, you go in, you get your groceries, and you get out. Because who wants to be there anyway, right? Let's just get this over with. But what if it's an opportunity? What if I assume the value of every person I encounter? So I look at this person as a child of God who is having a bad day and say, hey, um, do you mind if I pray for you? I could even be more specific. Hey, is there, can I, can I pray for your family? Is there anybody in your family I could pray for? Or when, you're, when you're with somebody that you know loves God, you can say, hey, if you, if you could ask God for one thing, what would you ask God for right now? Can I pray with you about that? Like just some courage and boldness. It, it, it assumes the value of the other person and it gives us a chance to move people forward. Nehemiah does that well. This, this, uh, another element of this boldness, this courage, is vulnerability. Vulnerability is letting people see the real you, right? That takes some courage, doesn't it? And it's difficult. I'm in, a, in a, a group with some guys that we meet once a week, and there is a pretty high level of vulnerability in our group. Guys, are, they're sharing very personal things that have happened and things that they're going through and asking for prayer for real-life situations, and at first, that was really, really hard <laughs> because, I mean, you've got to trust the people that you're around in order to be vulnerable, but somebody's got to lead out. Somebody's got to set the example. And so when you do that, I like the way Justin talks about this. He says, vulnerability feels like weakness to you and looks like courage to others. It does, doesn't it? It feels like I'm sharing my weakness, but what I'm communicating is courage that I trust you and that I'm willing to invite you in. And that's a big part of, of this essential, that you're valuable to me. Therefore, I'm, I'm going to just lay myself out there. I'm going to be vulnerable to you. So Nehemiah's courage before the king sets him up to go back to Jerusalem, and he takes all the supplies that the king has so generously donated to his cause, and he goes to Jerusalem. He rallies the people, and they build the wall in an incredibly short period of time, less than two months. It takes them to build the wall. And we're going to skip ahead to chapter 5 for our final essential of the morning. In chapter 5, uh, verse uh, 1, I'm going to read a few verses here. Now, there arose a great outcry of the people and of their wives against their Jewish brothers. Okay? So some of the people are upset with their, their Jewish 
brothers. For there were those who said, with our sons and our daughters, we are many. So let us get grain that we may eat and keep alive. So we don't have enough food to eat. And there are also those who said, we are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our houses to get grain because of the famine. There's a famine on, there's not enough food, so we've mortgaged our land to be able to buy grain. There were those who said, um, we have borrowed money for the king's tax on our fields and our vineyards. Now our flesh is as the flesh of our brothers, and our children are as their children. Yet we are forcing our sons and our daughters to be slaves, and some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but it is not in our power to help it. For other men have our fields and our vineyards. So some were saying, the king's tax, we can't afford to pay it. So we've sold our children into slavery to be able to pay the king's tax. Who did they sell their children into slavery to? Who did they mortgage their fields to? Their Jewish brothers and sisters, the noblemen, the people with the power and the wealth in the city. We're taking advantage of those who are poor. Now, it's important before we get to this next part and understand why Nehemiah has his response, that these people don't live in the same sort of society that we do where, where kind of this democratic republic idea is sort of built in. And we, we have this understanding that every, everybody has a voice. Everybody gets to ask for what they want. It wasn't like that in this time. The nobles, the people with the land and the money and the power, they had a voice. The poor people did not have a voice. No one cared what they thought, except for Nehemiah. They have these problems and they think, who could we go to? Who would listen to us? Nehemiah would. He had built some trust with them so that they came to him with their problems and they felt like he would care about what was going on with them and try to help them. So here's his response, verse 6. I was very angry when I heard the outcry and these words. So I took counsel with myself. I love that line. I took counsel with, so it's like I asked the smartest person I could think of, self, what would you do in this situation? Um, I think what he's really doing is he's calming down. He's really angry and acting out of that anger may not be the wisest thing. So he's, he's sort of like, all right, self, let's, let's think about this for a minute. I took counsel with myself and I brought charges against the nobles and the officials. And I said to them, you are exacting interest each from his brother, and I held a great assembly against them. What Nehemiah is demonstrating here is our third essential relational IQ. Relational IQ is just this ability to understand people, that desire to understand people, and a willingness to go the extra mile to understand um, the needs and the, the situation of the people that are around us. In order to demonstrate relational IQ, we must assume the value of every person we encounter, or we just won't take the time to get to know people. We won't take the time to hear their side. We won't take the time to understand why they think the way they think and why they do the things they do. We have to start by assuming the value of every person we encounter. And because you're valuable, I will listen actively. And this is exactly what Nehemiah does. He listens to their outcry. He recognizes that not only is this really just not fair, but it's actually against the Mosaic law for them to charge interest to their countrymen. It's against the law. And so he says, you got to knock it off. And the nobles say, okay, you're right. And they quit charging interest and they return the land back to the owners and they release the slaves. Because Nehemiah was willing to listen. He was willing to take the time to hear the complaints of the people that were being oppressed. And he did them a great honor These were not people who felt valued by their society. Nehemiah gives them the gift of hearing them. Do you realize that? When you hear someone, you're giving them a gift. Just that opportunity to share what's on their heart and that you're going to listen. And you're not going to try to fix everything and you're not going to try to give them all the right advice, but just listen and understand. And he does that for the people who are poor. And he turns what could have been a very divisive moment in this struggling nation into an opportunity for unity because these people had to work together to finish the wall. So he unites them by demonstrating some relational IQ, being willing just to listen. And sometimes that is just the greatest gift. Uh, A little over a week ago, um, I had somebody come in, uh, make an appointment to come in and see me, and I didn't know what it was about. I mean, people come and see me for all different reasons, and, um, 
I usually assume somebody needs some help with something. And that's why I'm here. So I'm happy to sit down and meet. And Nick comes in and instead of asking me for help, he says, how can I help you? What can I do for you? How can I serve you? How can I encourage you? How can I support you? That was such a gift. It was such a gift. I was able to just share what was on my heart with him. He prayed with me and then left and never asked me for anything. It was awesome. It was a gift. You can give that gift. There are people in your life who just need someone to listen. Just sit down and say, what's on your mind? How can I serve you? How can I pray for you? How can I encourage you? That level of relational IQ demonstrates a high value of the people around you. No one can walk away from a conversation like that and not know that they are valuable. It's a gift. So that's one of our essentials. We want to encourage you to listen actively. And I think you guys are pretty good at this because I still get caramel M&Ms from time to time from you people. I said it once. People remembered it and acted on it. I'm running a little low. Uh, just <laughs> on a side note. But that's what it's about. Listening and then acting on what you hear. and Being willing to take action on, on people's behalf. So uh, today I just want us to, to, to rest on that one idea. Assume the value of every person you encounter. Just, just default to that. They are created in the image of God. Every person you encounter is someone for whom Jesus died. Everyone. And if we just assume the value of every person we encounter, and then we put ourselves in a position to serve, to, to demonstrate courage, to ask boldly on their behalf, to sit and just listen to them, I, I think we have opportunities to help people move forward in our relationship with Jesus, to grow our faith, to produce more fruit, to see more lost people come to Christ. And I know that when it comes to that, when you think of five or 6,000 people within a five-mile radius of this church don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, five to 6,000 don't know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, and you go, well, somebody should do something about that. Isn't that what we pay Adam for? What would you pay me for is to tell you to do it and tell you how to do it. So that's what I'm doing. <laughs> but we go, we go to that problem. We go, I don't have enough resources. I don't know enough Bible verses. I don't have enough courage to solve that problem. But if you could bring to God the little bit that you have, maybe Jesus could take that and bless it and multiply it in a way that impacts many lives. Are you willing to just bring the little bit that you have? Be a servant leader, demonstrate courage and relational IQ. See what God can do with your five and two. That rhymed. I didn't mean for it to. That's cool. I just want you to go to God with that prayer this morning. Would you, would you stand and pray with me? For most of us, we can look at, at one of these three elements and recognize that um, I could use... I could use some growth in this area, either servant leadership, courage, or relational IQ. So just take one of those to God and say, God, would you help me? Would you give me more courage? Would you help me to be a better listener? Would you give me the posture of a servant? Would you take that prayer before God? And let's see what he does with it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this challenge today from the life of Nehemiah. And we, we see the example of Jesus all throughout this story. And we just pray that you would Fill us with your spirit to be people who, who serve others joyfully, people who ask boldly, people who sit and listen because we see the value in others. And would you use just that little bit that we have to offer and multiply it? And God, we pray, we pray that we would see hundreds, thousands of people come to Christ through the little five and two that we have to offer. Would you use that, Father, for your glory? In Christ's name, amen.